person of the day, right? Hey, everybody. Oh. Yeah, we do. Hey, everybody. Welcome to March uh, oh, webinar. People. Yeah. On the, on the photo for this, I put February 27th, but it's actually March 27th. The year has been moving quickly. It's been busy. Hopefully, it's been good for everyone on here. And uh, if you're on the webinar, you can chat in the chat box. Um, if you happen to have called in, you can see the slides later. It'll be on YouTube. Also, you will get it emailed to you. Um, so let's get into this. I so somebody who's called in asked a question. Called in? They can't. They can't. Okay. No. They can't do it. So uh, let's get into the slides. How do I do this full screen? How do I hide this? Okay, here we go. So... Managing the clinical research process from startup to closeout, Chris. Great. Your favorite. It's the full spectrum of everything, right? So startup, we just did a site select. We did a site selection visit and a site initiation yes. visit. SSB slash SIV. Yeah, for our CRO. Here, here. Get a huddle close to the mic, Chris. All right. Uh, so what were your experiences as First time as a CRO, you did an SIV. You can, honest truth. Yeah, well, maybe they might be listening. No, they're not. I don't think they are. And even if they are, they are, it's nothing they haven't heard. Speak into uh, the I mic. Was, I was joking. Speak into the mic, sir. So, uh, yeah, it was a bit, a bit hectic. A bit hectic as uh, they were not fully prepared um, for our visit. So being that it was primarily the site initiation visit, the problem was the actual site selection visit had never occurred. Mm -hmm. So a lot of information that would typically be gathered or already prepared for the SIV had not been done. So it was more or less uh, both visits. They were for sure getting the trial, so it wasn't necessarily a site selection visit. So that was a very timely visit for us considering mm -hmm. that we're doing this webinar today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this is for research clinics. This is for CROs. This is even for sponsors or anyone interested in any of the above. So, or CRAs for that matter. So let's get right into it. Amy made some really good slides. Yeah. Have you looked at them? Um, so you're making an assumption. <laughs> I think I have looked at them. Oh, okay. Now I'm not sure how to move them. That could be a Just problem. Just arrow, right? Yeah, but it's not letting me do it. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, slide two. We figured it out, ladies and gentlemen. So clinical research essentials. Amy, once again, did a very good job. Okay. In order to manage a clinical research process, you will need a site. This is the minimum you need. A site, a PI, a study coordinator, and most importantly, a study. Right? Most important of all. Eh, you need some patience too, but yeah, I mean that that gets you the study. It doesn't uh, really generate any revenue. Without patience, you can get up until after the SIV. Mm -hmm. Without patience, after that, whether you want to make money or not as a research site, like Chris said, all depends on getting those patients in there. So these are the basics that you need to manage a clinical research. I guess the process of clinical to get research. a study. To get a study. To get a study. You need those items. So next slide. There's 18 slides. We've got to move quickly through these. Well, we could even go in depth, more in depth than that previous slide because you need to get the right PI. They, don't, they shouldn't have any uh, history of audits or FDA problems or problems with their license. I mean, we could go in depth in each one of these, I'm sure. But yep. we've covered that before, so we're just highlighting here. So business development, this is what Chris and I specialize in through our consulting firm. We get studies for sites and for CROs and for ourselves and for our own sites. So without studies, you cannot generate revenue. You can hire a service like us, or there's other ones, not as good as us, but they're out there to do it. Or you do it yourself. You go on clinicaltrials.gov, drugdev.org, other CRO databases, and you sign up 
and it's a matter of reaching out, follow up, follow up, follow up. My favorite slogan. That's my motto. Haven't been doing a lot of it. I need to <laughs> eat my own dog food. Uh, Chris. I'm not sure I like that expression, but yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, yeah. Uh, search for indications and open studies. Contact and network with project <laughs> managers. It's a numbers game. Okay. If you're going to contact 100 people, and this is for the people that are looking for jobs too. If you're going to contact 100 people, 90 of them are going to ignore you. 10 will respond. Some Half of them will respond unfavorably. Like, why are you messaging me? Or no, we're not interested. Mm, I think the most common is, uh, how did you get my contact information? Yeah, and then You're you can give them some story. Or you tell them what you want, right? Yeah. We're, we're not here to judge. Sure. You tell them whatever you want. Say, you know... As a federal requirement, studies are supposed to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov, and your name is on there. Mm -hmm. All right? Unless you get it from a contact, then it's up to you how you want to tell them how you got the study. You got it from a contact. But it's a numbers game, okay? A numbers game. So for acquiring study, it's a numbers game. This is what DSCS is built on, is we have an infrastructure, a team out there looking for studies or already have studies looking for sites, so this is what we do. Okay, next slide. There's eight, eight of these slides, Chris. Yeah, we're through two. That's good. A, a four. Oh. We're on slide four now. Excellent. Acquiring CDAs. So this is where a lot of new, and speaking to the mic for this one, a lot of new clients drop the ball because they don't respond quickly to their yeah, CDAs. Time, timing is of essence in this regard. So explain, explain. <clears throat> not always, but often. Um, they're looking to get a quick turnaround on the CDA so they can start the process of selecting sites. If you miss that turnaround space, which oftentimes is no more than two weeks, mm -hmm. oftentimes you'll see a CDA come and it'll say on there, urgent response necessary uh, expected within two days. So once that, that, oftentimes, once that deadline's come and pass, it's too late. You can no longer apply for this particular trial. So, yeah, it's, it's of the utmost importance to respond to CDAs quickly, more so than any other email you receive in regards to getting a study. Okay. Keep in mind, even though you signed a CDA, you're still allowed to forward the contact to a colleague. You can't forward any study-specific stuff, but you can tell them, hey, this study on clinicaltrials.gov, you send them the link, this is the contact for it, Reach out to them if, you, if you're interested in sure. perhaps being considered for the study. Uh, check your email. Like Chris just said, they should be reviewed and returned back ASAP. This is now, so far we're in the pre-site selection phase. You're in the business development stage, sure. right? So this is important because if you don't get that CDA back quickly, they're going to move on. There's a lot of sites out there, even in a busy year like this year, they're, they don't have time to waste with, Sites, you know, we've had one client sitting on their inbox. A CDA was in their inbox for months. Yeah, never returned. And, and then they like, realized months later, and yeah. hey, guess what? That train has left the station and a long time and ago. And they're like, hey, I want this study. This is a great study for my site. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's too late now. That train has left the station months ago, Yeah, sir. So don't, don't be like that client. Uh, feasibility survey, that's next. So if you should be so lucky, after you do your CDA, you will get a feasible, if you should be so lucky. Yeah, I think you're pretty, uh, most likely you will get a feasibility if you get a CDA. Most likely. I would say the odds are about 75% of the time. Okay. So a feasibility survey is how the sponsor gauges your site's capabilities. So your investigator's experience, your coordinator's experience, your patient database numbers, your previous study experience. They are looking for, at the end of the day, what? Without even looking at the slides, what are they looking for? Well, number one, well, I think there's a few criteria the site needs to meet. One, is there any other site they've already selected that's in competition, in direct uh, relation area-wise, geographical location to this site? Because if there is, that's when you're not getting the feasibility, or, or you know, if your CDA has the address on it, they already know they have a site in that area, that's when you're not going to get a feasibility, oftentimes. Uh, they don't want competition for patients. Um, now I forgot your question. 
What are they looking for? Oh, so on the feasibility question, the number one thing they're looking for, number one, far exceeds everything else, is can you get the patients for the trial? Mm -hmm. Number one, easily number one. Number two is can you conduct the trial? Right? Can you do it safely? Do you have the necessary equipment? Do you have all the proper staff? And do they all have the proper training? All of that is number two and, and a distant number two to can you get the patients. That's the most important aspect of the feasibility, of the questionnaire. feasibility questionnaire. Yeah. Okay, next. Now, now should you be so lucky after your feasibility survey? And let's shed a little color on that. So people are going to say, well... Are you supposed to exaggerate on these surveys? Do you give them the accurate numbers? It's up to you. Up but, to you. but in this industry, it's a fairly well-known fact that most sites exaggerate their capabilities. You just don't want to exaggerate too much. Yeah, you don't want it to be ridiculous unless your site <laughs> truly has that capability. Right. Which then they'll find out at the site selection visit. Right. So this is why everyone needs to be on the same page. Whatever numbers you put on your survey... The, the the monitor is going to have a printout of the survey, yep. and they're going to confirm your answers. So if you said you're going to enroll 15 patients and three a month for five months, and then at the site selection visit, they ask your PI the same thing, and he or she says, "We're good. I think we can enroll seven patients. Or worse, and two. Maybe <laughs> two, and maybe screen one every three months. Yeah. Well... They're not consistent, so everyone needs to be on the same page. Yes. All right. Um, now it's okay if your numbers change from the time you did the survey until the site selection visit. Things change. You could sure. get a new sub eye. Have an explanation. You you can lose a sub eye. You could have gotten a new sub eye. Mm -hmm. All right. So you can either have more patient projections now or less. Um, once they review your feasibility survey and determine you're a worthy site, they may contact you to arrange for a SSV. This visit, nowadays, a lot of them are, are done remotely through a phone call. And that's what I would interject there. That that's only typically when that sponsor or CRO has already done an in-person site selection visit. Right. Typically. Right. Yeah. Not the, so the majority, uh, in the majority of cases, um, you will still have an on-site SSV, but in increasingly so. Mm -hmm. We're doing more remote monitoring oh, yeah. every site time, selection visit. We're time, actually doing one. Every time it's remote when we've already been visited by, again, a mm -hmm. sponsor or CRO. Every but time uh, us, as, uh, acting as our CRO, sure. we're sure. doing a couple of uh, telephone SSVs. Yeah, but again... if It's not a traditional study. Exactly. But it is. It is and it is. Yes. Yes. Way they're handling things. Once again, respond in a timely manner. when they add, They're going to email you. Okay, once they see your feasibility, they're going to email you, what are some dates we can come out and visit your site? You need to respond quickly, or they're going to move on. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Same thing as the CDA concept here. After the SSV, you will receive a site selection letter letting you know whether or not you were awarded the study. Right? Sometimes they'll send an email. And sometimes they don't send anything. And sometimes they don't send anything, and... In those cases, you need to follow up. Most likely, that means you didn't get the trial, but yes, I would agree. You should follow up, even if you didn't get the trial, and find out why. So that, And they won't tell you all the time. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't hurt to ask, because they might, and then it might help you get better next time. Okay. Sometimes it's not even your fault. They just say, well, we had enough sites, and... Sure, or a competing site in the area. Competing or... site in your area, for all you Florida sites... And California sites that should sound familiar. Um, how soon after the SSV will vary? It could be on the day of the SSV. Sometimes they'll tell you you got the study, or it could be months later. What's the longest you've gone? Two years. Two years. So you've had an SSV, and then two years later, we're awarded the trial. And did you follow up in between? No. 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 And they just randomly emailed mm -hmm. you. Wow. It just for some reason there was a delay in getting the trial started. Now that's not typical. No, typically that's not. it's that's uh, absolutely not. Typically it's on the day of or months later. I would say typically you're notified within no longer than three months. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I would say on average it's thirty days. Typically new sites will take longer to get a response versus add on sites. So if it's a new study, um they have to do 
all the SSVs for all the potential studies before they make decisions. Mm -hmm. If it's if you're an add-on site, so if the study is already ongoing, you should hear a lot quicker. So it would be helpful for you to know: is this study already going on, or is are we an add-on site, or is this a new study? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that that should help you with the time frame. And you're absolutely right. Add-on studies uh, get started much quicker. And it is up to you to follow up if you have not heard back. That's the variable. Sometimes they forget. I've done it a few times where they're like, you know, it looked like we fell through the cracks and I followed up and they revived it. Somebody dropped the ball. That's good. And if I didn't follow up, that wouldn't have happened. Absolutely. This was years ago. I haven't sure. been following up. Haven't been eating my own dog food lately. We've had others do it for us. See, I don't like that because I have this mental image of eating my own dog, eating dog food. I have dog dogs. food is, does not taste good. Yeah, it doesn't look good or smell good. So yeah, um, always, always, always take on more studies than you think you can manage. That's my opinion. Chris is making faces over here. Well, explain why. Tell them. So talking to the my rebuttal to that would be, if you truly have all you can handle. And you you know you're going to be busy for the next say six months to a year, and you take on this trial that you know you cannot dedicate any time to whatsoever. You may not enroll any patients. They may take the trial away, and it may look kind of a black mark on your record with that particular sponsor or CRO. That's why I'm making a face of that. Okay, yeah. So there should be a caveat here. So always take on more studies if you think you can at least roll one patient. Yes. Okay. Even if you're overworked, yeah. if you think you can get one patient in that new study, take it. Why? Because these days, studies end quickly. Oh, yeah. They have risk-based monitoring. They have data analytics. They can see in real time safety, efficacy, sure. everything else. Trial's not working. It gets shut down. It gets shut down quickly. I this trial to go for a year, but it might only last... Three to six months. And that was not the case 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they would have to wait. They would do interim database logs. They still do interim database logs, but they would do them, and that'd be the only time data would get analyzed. And that's when you would find out, is this study continuing or not at that point? Yeah. These days, that's done in real time. Yeah. So you can lose a study. You, you may be overworked this month. And then next month, you might lose two studies. And now, guess what? All of a sudden, you're underworked. Yeah, it's happened to our sites in which we've lost two studies in a month. Yeah, many times. They shut them down because, uh, like you said, safety or efficacy issues. If you end up with too many studies, you can always reduce recruitment in the lower paying ones. Um, but you should always put at least one patient in every study. Yeah. Don't take, a, don't take a study if you don't think you can enroll one patient. Mm, I would agree. That would be the only caveat here. But otherwise, Amy did a fantastic job. Yeah. So we got more slides, though. This is not over. The study process is far from over. All right. Well, we better get to moving. We're at the halfway point. So slide 9 of 18. Always negotiate your contracts and budgets. Chris, you're the subject matter expert on this. Please shed some light on uh, for Guru Nation. On why? Well, since we only ha have ten minutes left and nine slides to cover, I'll, I'll yeah, we did a full webinars. We did full webinars on negotiating. Yes, I'll, I'll very much limit this. So, this is a business to business uh, industry, and what's the main function of a business is to be profitable. So, when a CRO or sponsor sends your site a budget, they're not sending you. Well, there's exceptions, but typically they're not sending you the best there is to offer. So. There's lots, lots, or at least a minimal amount of money to be still had. So make sure and negotiate your budget. Never just accept what is offered. Okay. Always try to turn around your negotiation within one to two weeks. It's another thing like the CDA and like the feasibility. Don't let it sit in your inbox. Sure. You you want to return it, uh, but it's funny because in the feasibility questionnaires that often asks how long does this process typically take at your site? Yeah. And at our sites, no One more two than two weeks. weeks. Yeah. No cool. more than two weeks. However, oftentimes I'm finding now where they, once you send them your counter budget, they're not getting back two, three, even four weeks later. So, you know, it's all dependent upon how quickly they return. 
They being the sponsor of the Sierra. Correct. Mm -hmm. Startup regulatory. This is another time-consuming component. A lot of new sites are overwhelmed and intimidated when they get here because they get this email with this all these regulatory documents and they have no clue what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? But when you break it down, it's quite simple. You get a 1572. Yeah, they're fairly self-explanatory. Financial disclosure, IRB questionnaire, delegation of duties log, other essential documents. These documents should be completed before your SIV. Make sure the PI, sub I, and all relevant staff sign off on these forms. Make sure you send your initial IRB submission so that your site can be approved. So as a CRO, when we went to our two sites, they didn't have any of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So just a quick plug for our services. So yeah, if, oh, you're, please. if you're a research naive site, we definitely guide you through this process. So a research naive site, as Dan said, is gonna have issues with a lot of these documents. So what we do for you as part of our services, if when you receive these documents, you fill them out, you send them to us, we will review them. And if there's anything incorrect, we will get on the phone with you and discuss this with you and walk you through on how it should be completed. Other essentials. So at this point, the sponsor will likely have sent you other essentials for the study, like regulatory binder, hopefully. Sometimes they don't provide them. Yeah, like uh, our recent visit. Like our Sierra, right? <laughs> so the sites just need to find a binder and put all these documents in there with dividers and sections. And Ten years ago, this used to be fairly common, I think, that they didn't provide regulatory binders a lot of times, right? Because I remember studies back then, every once in a while, we'd have to create our own. Yeah. It's been for like the last five years. They're always provided now. Probably yeah. Five, it seems. Yeah, they are. Uh, lab kits. Very important you have this. I just interviewed the CEO of Slope.io. We're going to be doing a webinar with him next month, a bonus webinar yeah. with Slope.io. It's all about lab kit inventory management. They're going to send you an investigational product. You need to do – all the staff needs to get trained on whatever it is they're doing. Obviously, GCP. Sometimes there's study-specific GCP training, IATA training for anyone shipping hazardous waste, uh, EDC training for everyone who's going to be having access to EDC, ECG training, any other assessments that require training, any other protocol-specific type of training. These all need to get done prior to the site initiation visit, which is the next slide. So the SIV, Chris and I just did two of these. Mm -hmm. Very fun. Oh, Very yeah. fun time. Better than Disneyland. At this visit, the monitor visits your site to conduct protocol training, ensure you are fully equipped with lab kits, source docs, and study supplies, ensure you have all regulatory documents in order, ensure your staff have EDC and IWRS access, review your SOPs. Essentially, they make sure you have everything in place to start screening patients. If anything is missing, the monitor will let you know in their follow-up letter, and they'll actually let you know at the SIV whether you're ready to screen or whether you have to complete certain things before you can start screening. Very important. Mm -hmm. Don't just start screening just because your SIV is done. Well, because I mean, you may have action. You may not be allowed to screen yet. Yep. Yeah, it could right? be a complication if you do. So now it's uh, source docs. Okay. So we do, we create source docs for our clients. You can outsource the creation of source docs or make them yourself, although it could be time consuming. Very time consuming if your name is Dan Svera. I'm horrible at making these things. <laughs> um, but we have staff that do it, and they do it pretty good. Yeah, they do. Um, reference the schedule of assessments in the protocol. It's the little cheat sheet for every study. Schedule of assessments tells you exactly what assessments are done at what visit. Don't forget the footnotes. Sometimes the footnotes are extremely important. I would like to make one statement about the source docs. Please. It's, it's all yours. While you said, and we absolutely do do this for our clients, we do provide the source documents, I recommend it's best if the coordinator prepares these because it makes them learn the trial. Oftentimes the coordinator doesn't read the protocol unless they have to prepare these source documents, which forces them to read the mm -hmm. protocol. Mm -hmm. and familiarizes them with the study. So, again, while we will do this, and absolutely do for many of our clients, I still recommend that coordinators do this. Yeah. Excellent. 
Okay. Follow your own SOPs. Really? Really. Is that, is that necessary? Absolutely necessary. Uh, You'd be amazed how many people don't, and that is one of the biggest audit findings for a sponsor or a FDA audit. Um, hire a coordinator. So this is very important. Coordinators are worth their weight in gold. Well, you don't have to hire a coordinator if you're going to act as one yourself. But then you then have to have a coordinator. Are, right. Either hire one or be one yourself. Yep. Okay. It will be difficult to manage study activities while handling business development at the same time. Always actively tend to business development because studies are prone to closing out early. The coordinator is the backbone of any study and will do 90% of the work. Probably more than that. Well, it depends on the site, but yeah. <laughs> Probably 99% of the work. Well, it could be 100, depending on the site. <laughs> Your coordinator will determine, that is very true, <laughs> sad but true. Your coordinator will determine whether your site is a green, yellow, or red site. You want to break that down? So Explain a green, yellow, red. So there's one sponsor Dan and I both love that use this system. And yeah. I won't name them. But I assume all <laughs> other sponsors and CROs have a similar system in place. So uh, the sponsor that, uh, again, we love. They use a uh, traffic signal system. So if a site is given a red light, that means never use them again, period. If they're given a yellow light, then it's a site worth considering, but they have issues. And lastly, if the site is green, they're perfect site, right? Great data, always get their numbers in recruitment, uh, enrolling patients. So, you know, absolutely use a green site. And that's their system. So. Uh, I'm sure all sponsors and CROs have a similar system in place. Okay. So be a yellow or green. Don't be a red red light site. Yeah. You won't get another study from them, whoever they might be. <laughs> and if it's a CRO associated with it, and the CRO manages multiple studies for multiple sponsors, it could be tough. a very bad thing. Yeah. You don't want to get on Quintile's bad side. Yep. Okay. Interim monitoring visits. So every six to eight weeks, yeah, everyone who's on, you're going to get the replay sent to you. Um, no slides, but the replay will be sent to you. So you can do screenshots of the slides if you want. Okay. Every six to eight weeks on average, a monitor will visit your site to do source data verification, monitor your EDC, and query any discrepancies, ensure you're following the protocol, review the regulatory binder. Make sure all the training is up to date. Obviously, it's important to have a good relationship with your CRA. And in most cases, CRA visits trigger your payments. So you need the data to be reviewed or verified or there's different there's different triggers for every study. Try so, to figure out what's your trigger. So I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, what's the trigger in a remote monitoring study? Let's say it's 80% remote monitoring right? How do they determine payments in that situation? It's usually when a visit has been confirmed as reviewed. So it can be reviewed remotely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry. And then uh, payments issue. Yes. Yep. So figure out what the trigger is and then um, go to work. Okay. Database lock. So we talked about that earlier at certain points in the study. Monitors will require all data up to that point to be entered free of queries and locked. So during these database weeks, you're going to be getting tons of emails from the EDC vendor. You're going to be getting emails from um, the monitor telling you to answer the queries, lock the database. They're going to lock the database. So you're going to be getting swamped. With, I'm here with them. You're going to be getting swamped with phone calls and all kinds of stuff, okay? So during database lock weeks, expect to be working on the EDC much more frequently than you probably do in a normal week. Um, you're going to be getting queried for seemingly trivial things. Um, sometimes those EDC vendors go haywire when they query <laughs> you. And they think it's something that is wrong or incorrect, and it's actually not. Um, just be used to that. So database lock. Every study has it. Just get used to it. Study closeout visit. Closeout. We're moving along. I don't think I've 
ever done a closeout visit as a monitor. You will be soon. I don't think soon. Yeah, within a year. Within a year, yeah. So closeout visit. I've done many as a site. Sure. And those are pretty easy. So they will occur after all data has been sourced, data verified. The CRA will come to collect any remaining IP, send out a closeout report to the IRB. The site actually has to send the closeout report. Oh, verify but, it's been done. Yeah, the monitor is going to verify slash encourage slash emphasize the importance of it being done. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our final check of your regulatory document, end dates on the delegation logs. All outstanding a- AEs need to end dates or ongoing. SAEs need to be resolved. Um, that's all, folks. Oh, no, one more. Invoicing and payments. Your mm-hmm. favorite. No, no. Our favorite. Well, we like the checks. So... Depending on the study and your contract budget, you may or may not be able to invoice for screen failures, transportation, other line items. Some studies require invoicing and others pay automatically. So SDV study visits when entered in EDC may trigger payments. Like I said, every contract is different. Make sure you pay attention to your contract and make sure that you figure out what those triggers are for the payments so that you can be efficient. And sometimes you got to keep the monitor on it. We've had cases as a site, we weren't getting paid. When I found out why, I called up the ladder, got to the um, project manager, and they said, well, the reason you haven't been getting paid is your monitor hasn't been verifying your visits. Mm. So it's an extra button they had to check, and we had nothing to do with that. That's a CRO project manager training issue. Sure, where they have to click this because it's been verified. And the CRA probably didn't do it for whatever reason. Maybe they forgot. Maybe they weren't trained. Who knows? Not that they're lazy, but it could be. Or, yeah, like you said, they weren't trained. Or they didn't know that they had to do that. Sure, there's any number of reasons. Right, humans, so. right. So figure it out. If you want to get paid, figure out those things before they become a problem. And add one more thing to this slide, though. Yeah. Um, most studies now have a holdback. So it's usually if you've done a good job on enrollment, you're going to receive a nice little bonus check there at the end. So... Most studies hold back ranges from 10 to 20%. And this is to make sure that the site is in, in compliance with all issues throughout the trial. You're not getting that payment until everything's resolved. Like Dan said, you know, at closeout, there's things that still need to be resolved. You're not getting that hold holdback check until all those issues have been resolved. And again, if you've done a nice job enrolling, it can be a fairly nice check. Speaking of training, we've got to do a training for one of our sites. Um, any questions, email me, Dan, at theclinicaltrailsguru.com. The replay will be on YouTube and will also be emailed to anyone that registered for the webinar. Thank you all very much, and we'll catch you all later. Bye-bye. I saw a number of questions, Bob.